الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع يمقنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين أما بعد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادعوهم لآبائهم هو أقصط عند الله آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي والعظيم respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته how many times in our lives we've been in situations where we've been advised by an individual or a group of people who seem to have experience about something that we don't have. And we are somehow hesitant to take what they've told us. For example, they might be within the medical profession and they've seen us practice something which is unhealthy. Therefore, they will say to us, make sure you don't do this anymore. For example, don't eat late at night. And when they see reluctance from us in accepting what they're saying, they often reply or follow on by saying, trust me, we know what we're saying, or you've got to believe me, or you've got to understand, I know what's best for you. you know? so these, these are expressions human beings use to try and convince the other to actually undertake or to obey or to somehow follow what they have requested them to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the creator of humankind and everything else, of course, has utilized this method in the Quran. How? He has come forward and instructed us on a number of areas for the salvation of human beings. Yet at the same time, he often reminds us that it is from him and you've got to trust him. And you may not agree. This is a very important, delicate point at the outset of the discussion this evening. It is not necessary that you and I agree with what has been instructed to us. Because the challenge in this day and age is, because of the wealth of information you and I are bombarded with, we often come to a conclusion that that doesn't necessarily make sense. And therefore, should it be followed? In Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the discussion with regards to individuals who adopt certain people and they consider them as their own sons. As we discussed, he says they're not actually your own sons. Your sons are the biological sons or daughters. Uh, and then he finally says, Wallahu yaqulu al-haq wa huwa yahdi sabil Allah is the one who speaks the truth and it is He who guides to the right path. So, the idea is that sometimes the scientific data points to the opposite. Sometimes experts say the opposite. But Allah says, remember, I, if you trust me and if you believe in me, you've got to obey me because I know what is best. Yes, most of us actually know this. It is actually a reminder. As an example, we are struggling in the West, and I say struggling because it's a, it's a common challenge, and that is a restaurant owner wants to serve alcohol. A Muslim restaurant owner wants to serve alcohol. And when they come forward, they say, well, you know what, it's not to Muslim clients. I will not uh, serve it to Muslim clients. Or they want to serve pork products, for example. And, uh, you know, it, was, it, would, it would only make sense because it would make my business flourish if I don't. Or, for example, if I allow, they say, I have to allow alcohol to be bought into the restaurant. Yes. They are thinking what? Of course, they are thinking desire. But perhaps they're thinking rationally in that sense that I need to make money here. And therefore, I allow play around with the rules or disobey them in this regard by saying it's okay. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is He who says the absolute truth. 
And therefore, when he has made, for example, the serving, the drinking, the supplying, the eating at the same table of alcohol forbidden, it is for a reason. Now, you and I may not understand it and may fish around and ask different ulama and different maraja for a loophole, some way in which we can somehow justify that burning desire to be able to serve alcohol or to, for example, sit at a table where it's... ...leads to the path of righteousness and the truth. It will not necessarily fulfill that uh, dubious mind or that inquisitive mind of the human being. It's very, very important at the outset for us to keep that in consideration. Now, verse number five says, Now, where are we in the discussion? The discussion here in Surah Al Ahzab is looking at certain practices in the Jahiliyyah at the time, 7th century Arabia, that he to abolish. And one of them was the fact that adopt certain individuals, they would call them, for example, they would call uh, an individual uh, Amr ibn Malik, and his real father is not Malik, but the one who adopted him was Malik. So they would call him that way. Uh, a real example is, of course, the adopted son of the Holy Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. His name was, of course, Zayd, Zayd ibn Haritha. He was a slave for Khadija, or he was gifted to Khadija sallallahu alayhi as a servant. She gifted him to the Holy Prophet, and he is, by the way, the only companion mentioned in the Quran by name. There is no one else. And he's mentioned in Surah Al Ahzab. We will come to a contentious, very debated, perhaps amongst one of the most uh, problematic verses discussing the life of a prophet in Surah Al Ahzab, which many, unfortunately, in the Muslim world have used to somehow put a question mark over his Asma, the Prophet's Asma. But anyway, Zayd is the only uh, Sahabi mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. And the Prophet of Islam loved him and basically freed him, then adopted him as his son. And they used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad because of this practice in Jahili at that time, which was commonly adhered to. But after the revelation of these verses, where Allah says you are not supposed to call the individual as far as their adopted father's, or their not real father's name, but by the father who was, of course, the biological father. So they went back to calling him Zayd ibn Haritha. His father, of course, was Haritha. And therefore, the Quran says, Aqsatu Allah. Now, what does this mean? You must call them because by their real father's names, because this is more just with Allah. Following on from the discussion in that last verse, you may not understand it, but in the eyes of Allah is more just. Although the, their real father has abandoned them, I'm looking after them, I'm the one who's fulfilling their needs. Why should I am not included? Because in today's uh, methodology or how people work, it's not a big deal. Back, back in the time it was, because people used to be called by their father, by their father's name. So you would find someone, the son of someone, and it used to be a big issue. Remember, this is agreed upon by many Muslims, that one day Salman al-Muhammadi al-Farisi, one of the great Sahaba, he was sitting in the mosque of the Prophet, and there was a few other companions who sometimes, because they saw the lofty position of Salman, wanted to kind of dig and hurt him slightly. So they started to boast about their own fathers. So they'll say, for example, I am the son of so-and-so. My name is this, Ibn this, from this prestigious family. And then they looked at him and said, Salman, who is your father? Because they knew he was a Zawastri, right? So he, they wanted him to say his father's name, I am Salman, the son of so on. And therefore, people would laugh or they would mock. He re responds back by saying, Ana Salman ibn Abdullah. I am Salman, the son of the servant of Allah. I was poor and I have become rich through one man. And I was 
astray and I've been guided through one man and that man is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he kind of, you know, uh, outsmarted them in that way by saying, you know, that uh, don't use the fathers to boast, so to speak. But it's the main method of identification of certain individuals. The Quran says it is better in the eyes of God. Aqsatu عند Allah. The verse then continues and says, فَإِن لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا آبَاءَهُمْ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَمَوَالِيكُمْ If you don't know their fathers, then call them by the fact that they are your brothers in faith or your mawlas. Now, brothers in faith, we know. So the idea is that you should respect them. They are, you know, part of this Muslim ummah. What does mawalikum mean? So, you know, don't call them by their adopted father's name. Call them by the fact that they are your brothers in faith or your mawlas. Either because mawla means friend here, or it refers to the slaves who have been freed and who used to be adopted straight away, and people often had a good relationship with them. So the idea is the fact that, you know, if you're going to call them, then call them either by the, their faith association, or the fact that they used to be slaves, so the names that they had in the past, use it in that particular manner. Now, what happens if people continued though? They defied God's law, and they continued calling people in the way they liked, the way they wanted, or their whims somehow led them towards. The Quran goes on and says, وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ فِيمَا أَخْبَرْتُمْ بِهِ Don't worry if you make mistakes, if it is something which you had forgotten, if it's not intentional when you call people in a certain way, and you had forgotten that the laws have changed, then there is nothing necessarily to worry about. And this, by the way, this part of this verse is used by our ulama and our fuqaha. You see, the Quran is a magnificent treasure. And that's why, you know, to be a jurist, to be a scholar of fiqh and jurisprudence, it's not an easy issue. It's not that there are parts of the Quran which says chapter of fiqh, right? You have to look at each and every verse. You might think it's not related, but you have to be able to extrapolate laws from it. So they look at this and they say, this part of the ayah, which says, even if you make mistakes, don't worry. They say, we use this in Sharia law, in the code of practice that says specifically, for example, if you are fasting and you've forgotten that you're fasting and you start eating, for example, that's fine. You haven't made your fasting week, as we all know. Remember, when I was quite young, you know, eight or nine, I was trying the fasting one day, and I'd forgotten completely. Somebody did present some biscuits or something nice. We were living in Iran at that time. And I ate, you know, I was very hungry. But then I realized I'm fasting, that it was quite a, a, a mission to stop me crying, because I actually thought that my fast is void. Whereas in reality, of course, as we all know today, that if you and I have forgotten that, uh, for example, we are fasting or we, add, we consume the food, then there's nothing wrong with the fasting as well. And likewise, things such as hajj, you know, one of the most troubling areas in uh, the practice of people as far as Sharia law is concerned is hajj. Because those who've been to hajj will recognize it's very easy to fall into error or mistake. So for example, the rulings are that you are circumambulating around the Kaaba that your shoulders should be, your left shoulders should be at the direction of the Kaaba, so you should not be turning, your chest should not be uh, facing the Kaaba in the wajib nawaf, in the wajib circumambulation. And the number of times people come forward and say, you know, by mistake, I just turned, I've forgotten, somebody pushed me, do I have to do it again? Well, the principle is very clear. If it wasn't something intentional, not something that you did by your own willpower, then there is nothing really for you to take into consideration. It is a mistake, it is something that you've forgotten, or is not your own doing? And therefore this part relieves the pressure, so to speak. And it needs to be there, because the fuqaha won't be able to say, if you make a mistake, it's okay, other than the fact that they must have evidence for this to be stipulated. 
ولكن ما تعمدت قلوبكم you will not be held accountable except what your hearts have made the decision to do this ta'amud means deliberately now once again look at the precision of the Quran the Quran says not what your limbs were uh, determined to do but your heart right so there's a difference there of course the idea is that if you make that intention to break a law an Islamic law that's what you'll be judged upon not to go for example go about doing something and you had not been in that particular uh, intention وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiving, all merciful. Why this غَفُورًا Rahim comes together? And why, for example, Aziz and Hakim <coughs> comes together? For example, Aziz means the dignified, but more likely to mean the all-powerful. Azza is power. Allah says, I am all-powerful, but I'm also wise, so I do not misuse my power. There is a, what? There is, you know, that, because sometimes you have people who think that they have power and they exercise it to whatever they want to. Whatever they want to do, they'll do, right? Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ He forgives, but he's also merciful. In which way? Can you imagine that, you know, you are at your house, you hear someone breaking in the house, a thief. Okay. So you go down, you manage to catch them, you manage to stop them from running away. Now, this is no way suggesting this is what you should be doing, but just as an example, an individual who forgives is an individual who say, you know what, don't do this again, and I'm letting you go. An individual who is merciful, in addition to forgiveness, it says, by the way, would you like a cup of tea? Yes? The idea is that it's much, it's ihsan, it's doing good. And ihsan and being virtuous in the Quran has many levels. One, two people that you know you feel that you ought to be virtuous towards. But the high level of ihsan is to reciprocate evil with good. To be able to uh, balance off or uh, return what the bad deeds of human beings with righteousness. And I tell you, from personal experience, it's very, very difficult. Extremely difficult. When you're uh, frustrated, when you're angry, when you feel uh, that your rights have been uh, usurped, it's very hard to reciprocate this with righteous deeds. But the harder it is, the more rewarding, as well as the more changing of the person, it helps. So how, it, uh, how we and I react, it's all to do with the degrees of how we want it to impact us in this particular way. Now, the next verse is of great importance theologically, especially to the school of Ahl al-Bayt, and one that constitutes one of the discussions with regards to Imama and specifically that of the commander of the faithful Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Salawatullahi wa salam Not only does it have theological uh, importance but also has wilayah over the believers more than they have over themselves. Now, this, what is this uh, awla refers to? In Arabic, when you have two things and uh, they're next to each other, right? And you favor one over the other, it is as if you have placed the awlawiya or the preference of one over the other. So simply, when you have uh, a, an option, you select one, and you consider that to be more significant, you consider that to be more important. The Quran says there is absolutely no doubt that as far as authority is concerned, the Prophet of Allah has a higher degree of authority over 
believers than the degree of authority that they have over themselves. When you and I want to do something, often the decision is ours. Often, most cases, yes, we want to undertake a particular task. The Quran says that if the Prophet came and said to us, you should not do this, then we must not listen to ourselves. Then the Prophet has that authority over us. And as we shall see, the Prophet of Islam gave this authority under the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a selected group of individuals, as the Quran tells us, and the narrations support it as well. It's indeed a very powerful concept. Some of the Mufassirin have said, this authority of the Prophet is only on social matters, religious matters, or juristic affairs. Why is this not acceptable? The Quran is what is mutlaq, not muqayyad. Mutlaq means absolute. The Quran hasn't specified areas in which the Prophet has a higher authority over the believers than themselves. He says it's everything. Worldly matters, akhirah matters, juristic, social, religious, spiritual, whatever human beings encounter and require in their lives, the Prophet of Islam uh, has that authority. Whether it's teen dunya, why is it important? Because in Sahih Muslim, we have a narration that the Prophet of Islam walked past the farm. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, can you advise us, should we fertilize the crops or not now? He says, fertilize it. So they fertilized it. After a few weeks or a month or so, they came back and said, Ya Rasulullah, look at the crops. They're dead or it hasn't produced any yields. You, what happened to your advice? He responds and says, I know about Akhirah. Dunya, you know better. Yes? That's in Sahih Muslim. Now, why is it that we reject this? Because clearly the Quran says there's authority to the Prophet of Islam. And by the way, there are other verses that are quite clear as well. Surah Al-Nisa, yes? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 3, uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse number 59 says, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ Obey Allah and obey the Prophet, the Messenger. Not say obey the Messenger in matters of Akhir. Everything. And so, when you obey the Messenger in matters of dunya, it must be correct too. It, must, it will never mislead you when it comes to uh, any issues. Some people may have an objection to that. And they say, okay, but how do we expect another human being to have such an authority over us, whereas he is a human being at the end of the day. Shouldn't this authority only belong to God? Of course, this authority belongs to God, but it's he who has given this authority to the Prophet and a group of people. And at the same time, the Prophet, as we believe, is error-free and sinless. Therefore, this authority that the Prophet of Islam has over us will never be misused, will never be somehow for, God forbid, whimsical desires and wants and needs. It is totally within the system and within the direction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants it to be. And of course the Prophet does not speak for himself. La ilaha illa Quran al-Hawa, Surah Al-Najm, verse number 3. Now, one thing to understand is that authority that the Prophet has is actually best for us. It's actually good for us. It brings benefit to human beings. So the Prophet knows Prophet is the best to direct, and we believe the Ahl al-Bayt after him who have this authority are the best to show us what is the best way to lead our lives, and therefore we must be able to be obedient. Now, the narrations with regards to this are many. For example, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, has mentioned, وَالَّذِي nafsi بِيَدِهِ He says, I swear by the one who controls my soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى أَقُولُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ None of you shall be believers until I, the Prophet, is more beloved to them than they are to themselves. How much do we like ourselves? The Prophet says you will not be a believer if you love yourself more than you love the Prophet. You have to love the Prophet more than you love yourself. But then you might say, well, I love both. I don't know who I love most. Do you know how we can test who we love most? When there is a a contradiction or when there is a, uh, a difficulty in choosing between what the Prophet has said we should do and what we want to do. That is the real challenge. That's when you know who you love most. 
But if you go, if you go with what you want over what the Prophet wants, that's the area where we are struggling with. For example, let me be a bit slightly more specific. People like practical examples in our lives, just to touch on a quite sensitive area that I'm concerned about in many communities. And that is what happens in weddings. And fortunately, having witnessed what's been happening over the last 15, 20 years in the West, or at least in the United Kingdom, from what I have seen, it happens in countries like the US and Canada and Australia, there is a growing concern amongst a number of people, scholars, others, about trends and practices of our community members when it comes to wedding nights. Why, you know, the, the, the dancing and the mixing between uh, men, and female, men and women, the type of music that's played when it's that, that kind of atmosphere as well, the reluctance to observe hijab in front of na mahram and so on and so forth in several communities. And it has gradually become more and more, not only acceptable, but if you don't do it, you've got a boring wedding. Sadly. I heard some of the families who say we've decided, no, we won't necessarily, we won't do a mixed, for example, environment where men and women are somehow uh, engaging, there's music, there is that kind of activities which are definitely forbidden in that way. And, you know, people have responded with uh, <coughs> negative criticism that, you know, you have to move on with the times. When I was discussing this with one particular individual, I was shocked to see or to hear from people about what happens in these places. And one, uh, several family members told me, you know, you shares, you're in cloud cuckoo land. You don't know what's going on. It's such a normal thing that out there today. It's a normal thing? Are we accepting it just because it's gradually becoming part and parcel of the behavior of our brothers and sisters, the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, the followers of Rasulullah and the Quran? But it's become more and more acceptable. One individual said to me, you need to calm down and chill out. I said, why? Is it only one night? It's okay. Estighfar afterwards and everything will be fine. Why are you so strict? Why don't you let people relax one night? Every, everything. You don't even want them to enjoy themselves in that one night. One other brother said to me, you know, there was a sister who normally wears a hijab, but on that one night, she decided because it's her wedding night, she, because she was wearing a wedding uh, dress, she would take off the hijab because, you know, uh, everybody expected her to do so in front of the men. And you hear these stories and you wonder. The Prophet has an authority more than what we have over ourselves. He has clearly stipulated that these acts are completely forbidden. Now, you might say to me, okay, you know, can we start slightly be lenient in this example and, you know, don't force religion down people's throats. Nobody's forcing religion down people's throats, by the way. But how are the couple starting their marital life? What foundations are they placing? How do they expect that this marital life is one that brings happiness to the heart of the awaited Savior, or to, the, to, the, to, to the heart of the Prophet, to the Ahl al-Bayt? Above all, is this practice and what goes on something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with or not? And so, when you and I come to think about these difficult decisions, these are tough moments in our lives. These are real, especially if one side of the family member doesn't want to do it and the other is saying, I didn't know you were like this. If I knew you were that strict, I would not agree. It happens this day and age, sadly, right? So just let's keep that in consideration, uh, not just this example, but overall, and maybe as part of the system of self-accountability, ask ourselves a very simple question on a weekly basis, daily basis, if we can, monthly basis. How many options or decisions did I undertake in this period of time that involved me going against the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt? How many? And how many did I prefer my own desires over what has been clearly uh, stipulated to be uh, permissible and that which is not permissible? Now, we have an interesting narration coming to this um, part of the verse, al awla bil min this narration is found in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Sunan al-Nasai. So Sunan al-Nasai is one of the six canonical Sahih Muslim, uh, 
uh, a narration book in uh, uh, the Muslim world today with our brothers down the Sunnah. The narration is from a man by the name of Burayd al-Aslam. He used to hate Amir al-Mu'mineen. He used to dislike Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he's, he later changed after hearing this narration and several others. So this narration is pivotal and it's considered sahih by many Muslims. Uh, he became one of the close Shia of the Imam after this. He says, I went with Ali ibn Abi Talib on an expedition, Ghazwa to Yemen. And I saw something which I disliked about him. It doesn't mention what it was. So I came to the Prophet and I criticized Amir al Mu'mineen. I criticized Ali in the presence of Rasulullah. He says, I saw the facial expression of the Prophet change. فقال, he said to me, Ya Burayda, O Burayda, Alastu Aula bil Mu'mineen min anfusihim. O Burayda, do I not have authority over the believers that they have over themselves? After this verse, yes. Qultu bala ya Rasulullah, no doubt you have that authority. قال, then the Prophet says, Man kuntu mawla fa'aliyun mawla. Now, he said this before Ghadir. This is our, one of our arguments. People say, okay, you know what? One incident, debate, discussion, there are 19 different uh, meanings of Mawla, and then Kuntu Mawla could be a friend. All this, you know, unfortunate discussion that goes on. It's not only in Ghadir. It is countless of other times. In fact, it started from the first day when the Prophet said to his family, who amongst you would be my successor, my, the vicegerent, my brother after me? Yes? And they laughed at him. This was when people like, for example, Abu Jahala and Sufyan were there, and Abu Talib was there, and they said to him, Look, he's placing your son as our head. Yes. It started from day one, and it continued throughout 23 years. There is no doubt about that. But you can see that the Prophet of Islam would highlight this using this particular idea of the wilaya. Now, remember, the Prophet of Islam, as the Quran says, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the nafs. وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ The soul of the Prophet as described in the Qur'an. So, as far as this wilaya is concerned, and indeed the verses in the Qur'an are many, chapter 5, verse 55, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا This authority the Qur'an has clearly established for the Prophet and for uh, in certain individuals chosen by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the next part is the other segment which is controversial too. وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ and his wives are their mothers. <coughs> this has been the verse that has been used to defend the actions of the wives of the Holy Prophet. So, a lot of our brothers and sisters have come forward and said that the wives of the Prophet should never be criticized. They should never be the subject of any analysis because the says they are our mothers would you say this about your mother of course our ulama our jurists many of them have come forward and said that public defamation of the wives of the holy prophet is not permissible neither is their accusation of indecency regarding their physical relation with the holy prophet yes some people unfortunately have gone out there and talk about you know, one wife of the Prophet had a relationship with another man during the life of the Prophet himself. That's not acceptable. Yes? That aspect also should not be, uh, you know, or the wives of the Prophet should not be accused uh, on this matter at all. Under the uh, mainstream opinion of the school of Ahl al Bayt and of Qaha. However, what does it mean when the Quran says, Wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum? That the wives of the Prophet are the mothers of the believers. How do we understand this uh, Quranically in respect as we will come to later in Surah Al-Ahzab and we will, it will become much more apparent but it is only in respect to the idea that they should not be married to anyone after the Holy Prophet. However, they do not enjoy the, right, enjoy the rights of the mothers that are, for example, biological or what normally the mothers enjoy. Not at all. And this is quite clear and it's very much established. There is no aspect such as inheritance, such as touch, 
What does it mean? Does it mean that, for example, any of the Sahabi can go and touch the hands of Umm Salama? Sorry, or my mother. No, none of this is allowed. It was not permissible. No Muslim today actually claims that. Yes? It is clearly understood that this is part of the system of preservation of the fact that the wives of the Prophet should not be married to anyone after him. You might say, well, was there anyone who wanted to marry the wife of Yes. Sahih hadith, established hadith say that, for example, Talha was killed with Zubair in the battle of Jamal. He wanted to marry Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. And so these, as we will see later, these kind of uh, obeyed this particular act. Uh, we have a narration from Imam Sadiq who says, uh, a lady came to Aisha and said, Ya Ummah, O oh mother. And Aisha said to her, No, I am not your mother. I am the mother of your men. Meaning, only with respect to the marriage issue. Only with respect to the fact that after the Prophet, uh, nobody can actually marry them. Now, how do we respond to this? In the idea that, okay, but the Quran is quite clear that they are mothers, and therefore, at least because of that aspect, let's not criticize them. How do we respond? Very simple. Chapter 66, Allah criticizes them. Allah says to them, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Asa rabbuhu in talakukunna an yubdilahu azwajan khayran minkun. Check, check, check uh, chapter 66, Surah Al-Tahreem. The famous story, yes, of two wives of the Holy Prophet, with Sahih Bukhari, clearly named as Aisha and Hafsa. He says, you know, in that particular story, uh, we won't go into the detail, but the Quran says to the wives, if Allah wishes, Asa rabbuhu, his Lord, not your Lord, Think about it. I don't want to go into tafsir of that ayah. Because, anyway. Asa rabbuhu in talakakun. If he wishes, he will divorce you. And yugdilahu aswajan khayran minkun. Allah will give him, the Prophet, wives better than you. Quran says, wives better than you. And then the previous verse says, in tatuba ila Allah faqad sadat kulubukuma. You need to say toba because your hearts have what have gone astray the quran criticizes them in surah al-ahzab we will come back later we will see that the quran specifically tells them of things not to do and indeed one of them actually went 180 degrees 100 percent against it by doing what the quran said you must not do so clearly that part of the verse is understood within a particular uh, context now the rest, rest of it says, That as far as the relations are concerned, the blood relatives are more entitled to inherit from one another in the book of Allah. Now, some have asked which translation of the Quran is uh, best to use, and which one are we using here. This is one by uh, our brother who is a Qom by the name of Ali Quli Karali. It's found online. Uh, website is al-quran.info in my humble opinion it's not perfect and no translation can be but it's the best that we have it's from our shia brother who has translated it effectively and very very well he's now undertaking work to translate Mufatih Jinan, another translation of Fatih Jinan, as far as i'm told now this next part of the verse is with regards to the next of kin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the blood relatives have priority as far as inheritance is concerned and this abrogated the system of inheritance that was placed at the beginning of the Hijrah. Let me just take you to that moment where the Muslims who had come from Mecca, the Ansar, the Muhajireen, were welcomed by the Ansar, the helpers. And some of them, as narrated in history, some of the people of Medina had married a few wives. They divorced some of their wives so that the Muhajireen would marry them to that extent. They offered them their houses and so on. So there was a rule, there was a law in Islam at that time that they would inherit each other because of the system of brotherhood. Yes? The Prophet of Islam brought together people from Mecca and people from Medina under this wonderful system of brotherhood. Yes? <coughs> in order to strengthen their relationship. But the verse abrogated this and said, now, as far as inheritance is concerned, only your blood relatives can inherit from you. No one else. 
because by that time, remember when this was revealed? After five, after Hijra. So, it, you know, five Ahij was the Battle of Ahzab, probably within a period of time after the battle itself. So Muslims had come to a particular point where that initial brotherhood, as far as inheritance, was no longer necessary as, as such. And therefore, the law was abrogated. Some of us say it's related to the idea that there are degrees of inheritance. You know, if you study uh, fiqh, you'll come to the idea that there are circles of people within your blood relatives who are entitled to inheritance, who will then be given it in accordance to how close they, you, they are to you in that circle. Yes. So for example, the first circle includes father and mother and brother and sister and so on and so forth. Yes, sons, daughters, and so on, uh, for example. And so then there is the uncles. And, and, and it, the circles kind of, as far as the blood relatives are concerned, are a few. And when people write their wills, they don't need to stipulate this because the executor of the will would then, with perhaps with an alim or someone else who's knowledgeable, would be able to look at the calculations and to, to, to come to uh, a conclusion as far as this. So some have said this is not related to the idea that uh, brotherhood is abrogated in that respect, but rather because the verse says, uh, So it talks about the believers and the muhajirin and says that, you know, they are entitled to inherit from one another in the book of Allah from the faithful and the immigrant. So it is somehow grouping them all together. So maybe it's that classification um, that is uh, meant in the Holy Quran, irrespective of uh, these opinions exist. The final part of the verse highlights something that we need to keep in mind. Barring any favor you may do to your friends or your comrades, this has been written in the book. Now, what does this mean? Quran is saying only the blood relatives inherit now. Except if you want to do them a favor. How would you do them a favor? Do who? Your brothers, you know, those which were joined by the Prophet, yes? How would you do them a favor? You've got a third to play with in your will. So, of course, when you and I are documenting this very important, uh, you know, piece of work, so to speak, this document needs to be um, done properly and consideration given to it, uh, Islamically and legally as well. It's, uh, you know, something to remind ourselves. Our uh, holy beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Says whomsoever uh, sleeps at night and their wasiyah is not under their pillow, yes, uh, is uh, what is part of the jahiliyyah. It's a practice of jahiliyyah. Or if they die in that state, they die jahiliyyah, in the state of jahiliyyah. So it's important that at any age, any stage in our lives, the will is prepared both Islamically and uh, legally. And this third element is crucial for us to understand too. So when we document the will, the Quran here is saying, you know what, think about others when it comes to this idea. So uh, first of all, ulama say you should never stipulate the amount in your will because it could differ when you pass away. So you should not say, for example, I need that thousands of pounds given to this person. If you have a third, or when you say a third, part of the third, you say, for example, 10% given to this, 20% given to that. So when, when it, came, it comes to the execution of the will, they first of all have to extract some things from it. So for example, the costs as far as burial is concerned, the cost with regards to Hajj Wajib, if that hasn't been performed, that has to be taken out from the assets that are left, the idea of loans that the person necessarily had, the mahar of the, the, the dowry of the wife, it has, if it has not been given to her completely, then it has to be taken out first, these kind of things. When these are taken, then the third can be extracted, and then, of course, according to the instructions of the uh, deceased, they can be distributed. But 
the Qur'an here is saying to us, you know, think about others, you know, when it comes to that kind of allocation. But also, ponder over the great benefits of Sadaqa Jariya. So, part of this, ideally, or the third that you can, by the way, during a lifetime, you can do whatever you want to with your wealth. You can give it all away. Yeah? But it has to be actually given away. Yes. Uh, but, but because of the wisdom of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment you pass uh, you know, on from this world, uh, then only a third of your wealth you know, can be uh, somehow used for what you want. And the rest, the two thirds, must be distributed amongst the inheritors. Now, Sadaqa Jari is important because if you and I invest in ensuring that the part of this is for a cause that continues to bring thawab and benefit till the Day of Judgment, then it's a great investment. Yes. So the advice is, whatever you want to do with your third, do it, but keep some at least for a project or an initiative that is ongoing, that's, that the reward will bring you thawab uh, continuously. Some narrations have pointed that this verse uh, in Surah Al-Ahzab is in reference not only to the inheritance subject, but, or, or inheritance of wealth, but the idea of the uh, selection of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala of certain individuals that they inherit the wilaya. Because remember, the verse says, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'mineen min anfusihim, then it goes on to say, it's only the family members, ulu alham, the blood relatives, yes? So, that it goes on to say, so we have a narration from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, which he was asked about this verse, he said, nazalat fi wildil Hussein. This verse was revealed in the merit of the sons of Hussein. Meaning, it's another one that has been interpreted to mean that this wilaya is passed on through certain individuals. Now, some people say, okay, is this like, you know, um, succession of kings, how they uh, pass on the rulership from one another? No, this is divine selection. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selecting not certain individuals, not that Imam As-Sadq chose Imam Musa al himself. It was, of course, as we all know, the decision from the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Verse number uh, seven is a new area within Surah Al-Ahzab. So, if I could just summarize the first six verses is with regards to certain practices, certain rulings, the requests of uh, the kuffar, the uh, mushrikeen, and others, uh, and so on. And the Quran deals with it at the outset of chapter 33. Now, it's with regards to a reminder to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him and his holy progeny, and of course a declaration to uh, the believers, to all mankind about the covenant that the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Taala has established with the prophets, as well as of course with all of us. How many of us remember an incident whereby we were given a covenant and we promised not to break it? This the Quran, of course, speaks about in Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 172. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Allah says that I took from the back of uh, the sons of Adam this um, uh, some kind of seed, so to speak, um, and I made them testify, am I your Lord? They said, definitely. Then the Quran says, but on the Day of Judgment will tell you that you were forgetful of this important event that happened. And some ulama say it happened in the existence before this, which is called Alam al -Dar. Some, such as Allah Ta'ala is saying, no, it happens for every human being separately when the soul is blown into the body. You know, that dimension, that is the moment where the covenant from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is specifically taken. Now, in Arabic, we took from the prophets this covenant. What is mithaq? Mithaq in Arabic is a rope that ties two things together. You bring a rope and you tie two things together, it's called a mithaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we took from the prophets some uh, pledge, some covenant. 
Uh, what is this? To fulfill responsibility of risala and tabligh, guidance of people in all aspects, invite them to God and monotheism, support and unify the message of other prophets. So all this is part of this covenant. That you know, one prophet after the other, and that's the beauty of it. You don't find any prophet coming and saying, by the way, don't believe the other prophet. You don't find a prophet not supporting the other prophets. And they're all within one system, within one clear direction, and that's monotheism, and that's the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah alone. Wait, Akhad Allah Mithaq and Nabiina Lima Ateita Kumin Kitab in Surah Ali Imran. We have this that Allah says, I took this covenant, this pledge from the prophets uh, regarding what is found in the book. But the question is, this pledge, this covenant that Allah says, I took from the prophets. First of all, why has the Holy Prophet of Islam been mentioned first? We took the covenant from the prophets and from you and Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa ibn Maryam. Why was the Prophet mentioned first? Some of the Mufassirin say because the addressee is the Prophet. So Allah is talking to the Prophet and he's saying from you I took the pledge and from the other four too. It's unlikely. Why? Because in many other verses in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the other prophets, so to speak. Yes. And so there doesn't seem to be supported. But the more likely reason Allah knows best is to highlight the superiority of our beloved Prophet over the other prophets. To demonstrate that his status is higher than the other prophets. And certainly because these other four are known as Ulul Azm. So these four mentioned here are not just any prophets by random. They are the highest ranking prophets with the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The other thing is, why is Isa mentioned with his mother? Isa ibn Maryam. Look at the others. It's only Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and then Isa ibn Maryam. And this is a common trend in the Quran, at least I think 16 times, you'll find that. Of course, it's to emphasize, to categorically establish the fact that Isa was born without a father. And his birth was miraculous in nature. And so the Quran, in any shape or form, sometimes you might say, well, once would have been enough. Once Allah will say, Isa ibn Maryam, will actually emphasize that Isa was born in this special way as a miracle. But no. The Quran in continuous fashion says Isa ibn Maryam, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa ibn Maryam, lest people somehow start to uh, and, uh, accept this notion that, you know, he had a father and so on and so forth, to keep reminding individuals about that special birth that Prophet Isa alayhi salam uh, enjoyed. Now, the final part of the verse is, وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا And we took from them a very powerful solemn pledge what is this significant well it shows asma error free sinless nature of the prophets notice once again i did not use infallibility because as i have mentioned in the past infallibility is a wrong translation of asma infallibility means unable to err or sin whereas the prophets were able to err and sin but they never did Likewise, the Ahl al-Bayt, the Ayman alayhi salam. So, infallibility as a word is not really an accurate translation of Asma. Error-free, sinless, yes, uh, is probably the closest that we can get to. One final point regarding this verse is that Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we took from them this very stern, very strong commitment that they will deliver the message at all costs. That the Prophets did so brilliantly, each and every one of them. They did not disobey the, only, the, uh, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is one thing that's interesting. The only other time in the Quran where we find this mithaqan ghaliva, this solemn strong pledge that is very much emphasized is in Surah Al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 21. And it's regarding dowries. Is regarding the mahr. This is not something to take for granted. Every word in the Quran is 
are placed carefully by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's, it's revealed uh, with intention, every letter, every uh, sign, anything within the Quran is not coincidental. Now, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about dowries in such a way and says it's a pledge, it's a commitment, it's a covenant that is very much firm and established and should not be taken for granted. Because of the knowledge that there are two things that are happening or has have happened in the past but not to the scale that we see today with regards to dowries in marital relationships or as far as um, uh, the way people look at them is concerned. Number one is with regards to the amount that is being stipulated in this day and age in certain communities. And the rejection somehow is as if the female or the sister is a commodity that's being sold. So I have seen, you might be surprised, I have seen requests for 124,000 pounds. Why 124,000 or 124,000 prophets? Let's make it spiritual. Yeah, let's make it blessed, you know. But it's still very high amount. Now, you might say to me, but, you know, we don't want to go into figures. What constitutes high? I'm not putting a limit or saying, but there should be also reason. There should be, you know, uh, some kind of uh, understanding that these uh, sums, uh, these figures, can constitute excessive burden upon the husband to actually fulfill uh, 14 kilos of gold. Yes, things like that, which uh, are unfortunately something that some communities are developing. And they say, well, when I ask some fathers or, or some parents, why is this? They say, well, you know what? Because in, you know, in certain communities, this is not paid only if the wife requests it or at least they divide it into two uh, parts, a small amount at the beginning, or only if she requests it at the end, or any time, or if God forbid there's a divorce. So they say, if it's a really high figure, he won't think about divorcing her. Excuse me, that's a very uh, backward thinking. You think that if somebody comes to a conclusion they want to divorce, you know, if they can't in any shape or form reconcile, yes, they will not live an unhappy life just because they have to pay a certain amount. Maybe they will, you know, think I'll make it up one day or they'll say, God forbid, they forgive me or whatever. They'll come to some kind of conclusion themselves. But it's not necessarily a determinant. I, I, I'm struggling to see how a huge sum, as far as Mahar is concerned, is a deterrent against divorce. Yes? The second problem is dowries that are not being fulfilled by, their, by the husbands. So they have committed to it, for example. Uh, they have uh, said we will give it and for example the marriage takes place and they have not done so. I deal with several cases sometimes, you know, one particular case we said to the brother, what was happening with the dowry? He said, you know, but I bought her a watch and I bought her this gift. Did you buy her this gift with what? He said, but yeah, in my mind that's part of the dowry. I can't read your mind. And did you communicate that to her or to the family? So it, it's that element as well. The shaitan comes into play and starts making people think all kinds of possibilities to get out of it. The Quran says it's a firm commitment and it's not a joke. It should be upheld, it should be honored, but it should be also respected and not necessarily abused within limits. And inshallah ta'ala, the next verse, uh, continues on this before uh, going into verse number 9 which uh, enters uh, nearly 17 verses describing the battle of the uh, Khandaq or known as Battle of Ahzab that inshallah we will discuss next week wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala ahli bayt al-Qaybina wa ahli